becomes large. So everything lives or dies by the exponents involved in trying to understand how many of them exist. Okay, so uh, this whole thing really got started with the question of Burdish, where he considered points and lines in the plane. So he asked how many instances can there be, and this was answered by Zimmer and Trotter. What they said is if you have m points and n lines, well then there can be at most m to the two-thirds times n to the two-thirds plus m plus n incidences. And really these are the exponents that we care about to make everything work. Great. So their proof was quite complicated, but there is a more modern proof due to uh, Sekely, which was from I think it was 97 or so, and it uses the crossing lemma. So actually, are you all familiar with this proof using the crossing lemma, or should I discuss it? Well, I'm familiar because I wrote this paper in Ori recently. Ah, uh, okay. The others, I don't know. So. I'm reasonably familiar with that. Okay, you as well. Okay, well, so we're going to do some more advanced stuff because this is a wonderfully uh, knowledgeable audience. So, um, Okay, so maybe I'll just draw a quick picture of what goes on, just so we're all on the same page. So I have a bunch of points, and I have a bunch of lines, and, um, and I draw a graph drawing. So, well, okay, I'm saying stuff that everyone knows, but um, a graph drawing is um, a way of thinking about a graph as some arrangement of the plane. So the vertices of the graph become points, and the edges of the graph become uh, curve segments connecting two vertices. So what's a curve segment? Well, really, it's a topological notion. So it's a simple open curve. It's the homeomorphic image of the unit interval 0, 1, something like that. And so, okay, so I have this graph. And sorry, the way I draw this graph is by connecting consecutive vertices along these lines. So these are the edges of my graph drawing. And every time two of those edges cross each other, this is called a crossing. And so what the crossing lemma says. So, so this uh, graph drawing is by straight lines? Or by doesn't have to be by straight lines. But in this particular example, where we have points and lines, it just happens to be straight lines. Okay, I have some questions to ask, but might be first. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll be a little more pedantic about this. So the the points really are points, and the edges of the graph are um, simple curves, so homeomorphic image of the open interval 0, 1, which end at the two points, which correspond to their two vertices. Their interior is not allowed to intersect any other points in this graph. And any two edges uh, are required to have finite intersection. So they're not allowed to look like that. That's if, and so and the number of crossings is just if I look at all pairs of edges and I count for each pair how many times they cross, that is my, the crossing number for this graph run. So if, if this is one edge and this is the second edge, this would be considered two crossings, even though it's just one, a single pair of edges they cross twice. So this would be something like infinitely many crossings. It would be a bit of a mess, so we're not going to allow that. But you're allowed to, uh, to oscillate a fixed number of times, I mean, like yeah. n being and very large. What we'll see is that this is actually making our life better, that this is on the, this is the good side of inequality. I see. So it could have uh, infinite uh, discrete, uh, so it, it, it could oscillate. Uh, it could, yes. So in this purely topological setting, which we're describing right now, it could. But as we're going to see, this, this is only helping us. If we in fact knew that every pair of edges crossed a thousand times, our bounds would get better by something which involves a thousand. So this is, this is good for us. Okay, one other question. <laughs> so uh, now suppose that you are not over the reals, but over an arbitrary real closed field. Yeah. And then uh, whatever now that you are going to write down, uh, and, and then of course we ask them what should be Notion of an edge, and then suppose I say that it is a, a semi algebraic uh, homeomorphism instead of just homeomorphism. Yeah, so I'm not sure, but I can tell you the crossing lemma is just a glorified version of, um, I don't know if this is called Euler's inequality, but it's if I have, um, 
we yeah. like have a bunch of simple C's, straight out simple C's. If I had something that looks like this, right? And so I count the number of faces, the number of edges, and the number of vertices, and I take the alternating sum, it's supposed to be the Euler characteristic of the sphere, I guess, because this is the outer face, which is minus two, or whatever it happens to be. It doesn't actually matter, as long as it's some fixed number. And so what that essentially says is if I look at the alternating sum of faces, edges, and vertices, and um, if there are, so let me get this right, the result I want to get to is if there are too many edges compared to the number of vertices, then there has to be at least one crossing. Is the sort of result that I want to say. And so if you can force that to happen in a semi-algebraic setting, then you can get the crossing level. Because so the crossing level. And so what is the, uh, so, it, so if you have, uh, so, so I guess you need the graph to be connected, right? You need the graph. You want to say V minus the number of edges plus the number of uh, faces to be two or something. Yeah. Well, so this is what is going to happen if the graph is planar, planar and, and, connected. and connected. And if it is planar but not connected, I'm going to get an inequality in a direction that is acceptable. So this graph does not actually have to be connected. So which way? Which, 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 good question. So what do I want to say? I want um, so, so I guess inequality should be in this direction. That v minus e plus h should be greater than or equal to? Greater than or equal to 2. Uh, otherwise? Yeah, so let's see. So what I want to force is, so first of all, the number of vertices and the number of faces can be related to each other. And let's figure out why. So each, ah, uh, yes. So each vert, um, okay, my, okay, I'm going to screw this up. But um, if we have a planar graph, then the number of vertices and number of faces, then these three quantities can be related to each other in a way that I'm currently blanking on. And all that we end up being left with is an inequality relating vertices and edges. So um, that requires some statement, which I'll think about for a minute. We get an inequality, which says if you have a planar graph, then the number of edges is somewhat small compared to the number of vertices. So it's at most, say, 10 times the number of vertices. So that would definitely get. Yeah. So if the number of edges is more than 10 times the number of vertices, then the graph is not planar, which means there exists at least one crossing. And that is all you need. That's the only topological statement you need to make the crossing lemma work. The crossing lemma is just using that observation and then a random sampling argument. So if your semi-algebraic setting can achieve something like that, then we're good. So, okay. So maybe I'll just write down what the crossing lemma says. So it's, um, so like G, it's a set of vertices and a set of edges um, via graph drawing. So this is not an abstract set of vertices and edges. This is actually a set of points on the plane and a set of simple curves. So then at least one of the following two things must hold. At least one of the following. Must hold. So either there are um, not very many edges. So the number of edges is at most, I think, four times the number of vertices. OK, so I'm using e for the cardinality of edges, basically, like that. I don't remember if this, this, this number four is sufficient, but we don't care about four, it could be sure. Or there's a lot of crossings. The number of crossings in this graph is at least, again, some constant. It would be a small constant. I think 1 over 64 is enough, but we don't care. Times the number of edges cubed divided by the number of vertices squared. And essentially, the way you prove this is we say, OK, imagine that there are far more edges than vertices. We're going to randomly sample our graph in some way to get almost down to the threshold where the number of edges and vertices are the same. That's going to force there to be at least one crossing. And what that meant, if after all this random sampling, there's one crossing, there must have been a ton of crossings originally. And how many? Well, this many. So that's where this comes from. OK, so let's just see briefly, maybe you've all seen this, how we use that to prove Zimmer and Trotter. Well, so in this picture, I'm interested in counting incidences. I'm thinking about lines. So for each line, I've drawn this edge between pairs of consecutive um, points. And so on each one of these lines, I could ask how many edges have occurred. 
And it's exactly the number of incidences that this line is involved with, minus one. So the number of incidences is um, number of edges plus the number of lines, which is n. Well, that's not quite true. I might have a line, a bunch of lines which aren't involved in any instances, but this is an inequality in the direction I want. Great. I can rearrange this a little bit. I could say the number of edges is less than or equal to some constant involving 64 times the number of crossings of the graph to the one third times the number of vertices to the two thirds. So that is true if I'm in this situation. If I'm in this situation, then the number of edges is at most four times the number of vertices. So if I want something that's always true, I could say, well, it's at most this plus four times the number of vertices. And then no matter which situation I'm in, this interval is true. So great. So I have number of edges plus n. I'll put the n over here. So this is n plus four times the number of vertices. I'll just say big O. How many vertices? Well, we call that m times vertices to the two thirds. So that's n to the two thirds. And then the key observation is how many crossings are there in this graph? Well, I started with n lines. Every pair of lines can cross at most once. So I have n choose two crossings, which is roughly n squared. When I raise that to the two thirds, I get, oh, sorry, this is the m to the two thirds, n to the two thirds. Great. So that's the bound of asymptotic proof. OK. So that is sharp. Uh, there are configurations of points and lines that achieve that result. And it's pretty much the only sharp result we know in incidence geometry. We have lots of bounds for other classes of curves, but we don't think any of them are correct. So as an example, instead of considering points and lines, you could consider points and unit circles. So M points and N unit circles. And we could run exactly the same proof. And we get a bound of O of M to the 2 thirds times N to the 2 thirds oops, plus M plus N incidences. And we don't think that's sharp. So there's the, the Erdős unit distance conjecture, which says at least if M is equal to N, this is M to the 4 thirds. We think it should be pretty much M to the power of 1, just a little bit bigger than that. We have no idea how to put it. So we just double check. How would I run this previous proof? to prove this result. Well, I have my collection of points, and I have a bunch of unit circles. So imagine these circles all have the same radius. And now I just want to draw this graph. And it's not quite a graph anymore, because if I have two points, I could actually have two unit circles, which intersect both of them. So this is actually giving me two edges between the same pair of points. So it's not a graph. But it's a multigraph, and the edge multiplicity is at most two for unit circles. And this crossing lemma also works for multigraphs. So the bounds get worse as the edge multiplicity increases, but edge multiplicity of two is totally acceptable. So great. What about points and arbitrary circles, not necessarily unit circles? Well, now I actually run into a serious problem. Because I could have a situation that looks like this. I have two points. Part infinitely many. You could have infinitely many, yeah. Well, okay, so if I started with n circles, then there could be at most n circles, but that, that's awful. So this sort of situation can certainly occur. And if you try to run the crossing lemma with the bound of the edge multiplicity is at most n, which is the number of circles, what you get out is, is complete garbage. It means, not surprisingly, a completely useless bound. So, so that's a problem that doesn't work. So Pop and Scherrer, we're able to salvage this proof through some clever counting arguments of various kinds that I won't go into any details on. But in order to do that, they had to find a way to describe what makes circles different from lines or unit circles. And the idea, of course, is if I fix two points, there's lots and lots of circles that pass through both of them. But if I fix three points, then there aren't. There's at most one circle that passes through both of them. And you can imagine another more general class of curves where if I fix four points, there's at most one or at most ten circles that pass through them. So they come up with a definition, which is we say a family of curves. So a family is just meant to be an infinite set. It's just, just a set, but I'll call it a family. So a family of curves has k degrees of freedom. So 
k is the important number, and multiplicity type s, s is not important. If two conditions hold, uh, whenever you have two curves, they intersect in at most s points. is for every set of k points in the plane, this is all in the plane, k points in R2, there's at most s curves from this family that pass through all k of them. Two degrees of freedom, so that fixed two points, there's the most one line that passes between them, multiple city type one. Unit circles have two degrees of freedom and multiple city type two. Arbitrary circles of any radius have three degrees of freedom, so on and so forth. So what Patton should have proved is if I have m points and m lines, which have k degrees of freedom. And multiplicity type S. You want N curves, I guess. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. N curves. Then the number of instances is big O of M to the K over 2K minus 1 times N to the 2K minus 2 over 2K minus 1 plus M plus N. So there's no S appearing here, which seems a bit weird, but this big O depends on S. Okay, so just as a quick sanity check, if K is equal to 2, which is what happens for lines or even intervals, this is 2 over 3, M to the 2 thirds, N to the 2 thirds, plus M plus N, so this is Zimmerty Trotter. So this is very much a generalization of Zimmerty Trotter, and it works for any collection of so when I say curves, these are some nice topological notion of curves. You can be fairly general about it. Um, but this is probably not sharp. Well, it is sharp if you have points and lines, because we know that. But for pretty much any other example, it's not sharp. In particular, the moment k gets bigger than uh, 2, we don't know any example where this is sharp, and there probably aren't any. OK. So what I'm going to talk about next is a new result uh, due to Mecha Shurir and myself, which essentially says, if the curves are algebraic, then we can do better than this now. I ask a question. Yeah. So this does not need the curves to be algebraic, right? But uh, yeah. if you so, uh, is this result valid over arbitrary real points field? I don't uh, know. So it's going to work. I can say with some confidence it's going to work over real closed fields if that previous proof worked over real closed fields. So it really comes down to this crossing lemma. Crossing lemma plus clever combinatorics, and the rest, all the combinatorics is pretty field independent. This next result that I'm going to talk about with Scherer, uh, I don't know if it's true of real close fields, but additional thought would be needed. It definitely doesn't. It's, there's more than just combinatorics at this point. Okay. So, this is, as I like to say, so this is the result of Scherer and myself around a few months ago. So if I have n points and n algebraic curves, of degree of both d, d is not important. It's going to, in the same way that s is not important, it's just going to affect some implicit constants. Uh, so interesting, though, just to make sure that, so when you say algebraic curve of degree d, this just means it's a polynomial? Uh, it is the zero set of a polynomial of degree at most d. d. Yeah, uh, bivariate polynomial. Sorry? By the polynomial of two variables. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Um, okay, I have this many points. And I want to say that they have k degrees of freedom. But that probably isn't what I want, because this is this topological notion which doesn't quite carry over properly. 
so, or at least it's not quite the result that we're able to work with. So I'm going to say they have k algebraic degrees of freedom. I'm going to define a little bit later what that means. But I'll say that in practice, for any reasonable family of curves that one might care about, this number k, the number of algebraic degrees of freedom, is the same as the number of degrees of freedom over there. So I'll define it here. Algebraic degrees of freedom. Then the number of instances is, uh, well, big O of, and the whole point is that our exponents are better. So it's m to the 2k over 5k minus 4 times m to the 5k minus 6 over 5k minus 4 plus m to the 2 thirds n to the 2 thirds plus m plus n. So if our results are a bit inefficient, so we lose an epsilon. And this big O is going to depend on both D and epsilon. So I would generally de-emphasize these exponents. I mean, don't, I sort of drew them small for a reason. These exponents are better than these exponents. Neither set of exponents are likely to be the correct answer. But the general idea is to get better exponents, you need new ideas. And so it's also not entirely obvious looking at these exponents that they are better than those, but, but they are. So just to give just an example, so if k is equal to 2, well, we just get back this bound right here that we were expecting, so it's nothing new. But the moment k is equal to 3, things get better. So an example would be arbitrary circles. Um, so in this situation, if we have circles, k equals 3, and we have m to the uh, 6 over 11 and plus x1 n to the 9 over 11 plus n to the 2 thirds n to the 2 thirds. And that's better than what's going on over there, for example. This k is larger. These bounds are just going to be the same thing because n then 7 over 7, 5. 17 over 11. Oh. Hmm. So I'm saying k is large. So this is like 7 over 5, right? This, this 7 this over 5. Yeah. Uh, when k goes to infinity, yes. 2 over 5 plus? Yes, yes. And that's bigger than 4 over 3. Okay, so, so this term can be bigger than, I mean, obviously. This term we generally expect to be bigger than this term. Yeah. If that was not the case, then. And you won't write it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that would be. So certainly there are examples for some values of m and n and some values of k where the number of incidences is larger than this term here. It's actually a, a conjecture, which I don't know if I believe. It seems very uh, out there, that if we have the same number of points and curves, so m equals n, then the answer is always m to the 4 thirds, no matter what case. And I don't know. That seems like a very bold conjecture. On the other hand, I don't know of any counterexamples. So um, it's an interesting thought, at the very least. So in this paper, or what we prove is if you have m and n, so the curves are definable curves in uh -huh. normal structure. So unless uh, this family, there is no interesting incidence result is possible, meaning that you could get mn incidences. So you say as long as that's forbidden. Yeah, uh, uh, so there's a condition which implies that. that. The, uh -huh. uh, otherwise, the Zevonian neutrality is free. Oh, interesting. Under these very general conditions. Right. And the m and n for any value of m and any value of n. Okay. Well, let's take a look. So there's definitely, if n is much larger than m, and k is equal to, even when k is equal to 3, I can come up with an example where n is much larger than m, and there's more than this many incidences. So presumably that example is somehow being excluded by your conditions, and yet this example is still quite interesting. I can draw you an example. It's not hard at all. It's um, essentially you take a a grid of points which has length, um, I need a new variable, it has length L and height um, either L squared or L cubed, I'll have to think about it, and then your curves are all graphs of polynomials of degree at most 2 whose coefficients are integers from 1 to L. And when you write down the number of curves you have, that's some number M, and write the number of points is some number M, you can write down the number of incidences, and then it's more than this. Um, okay, we should have talked about this because uh, 
So of course there is a constant that depends on the family, but but this is a very simple family. This is the family of graphs of three two polynomials. Anyways, we can write down some examples okay. later. Uh, well, for now, I'll just uh, run this. Yeah. Okay. So I can describe, at least in some detail, how one goes about grouping a result like this. And really, what we want to do is we want to run that original proof, or not the original one, but second least proof of the Severity Trotter theorem. And I can ask you what goes wrong when I try to run that proof. And the problem is that when I draw this graph, it's not a graph, it's a multigraph, and there might be really high edge multiplicity. So the sort of thing that goes wrong is I have this sort of situation. So I have a point here and a point here, and I have two curves connected. And maybe I have more than two, but at least see this. And we could forget about the points for a moment and just talk about the curves. I have two curves which look like this, and then if I'm unlucky, there could be some points there. So we have a word for this. This is called a lens. And it's just this sort of configuration here. So this lens, um, there could be other curves in my set of curves which pass through this, but just for the moment I'm looking at this, this is called a lens. The basic idea is I want to take my collection of curves and I want to cut them, which all that means is remove a point from one of the curves so that now I have two curves. And after I've done that, this isn't a lens anymore because really it's two pieces. It's this piece and it's that piece. And so after doing that, my, my enemy is gone. So the basic idea is I want to take a collection of n curves in the plane, and I want to cut them into a larger collection of curves, so that after I've done that, there are no more lenses. So if we do that, so here's this result. This is the theorem of also same paper. Myself. So I'll say. I'll write it a little bit informally, but I can answer any questions if it's confusing. So given a set of n algebraic curves, of degree at most d in the plane, we can cut them into roughly n to the 3 halves. I could say plus epsilon, we can actually do better than plus epsilon, but that's fine. Um, curve segments. So that all the lenses have been eliminated. How many lenses there can be? Yes, obviously, in order to do that, and this, that doesn't affect really how many if you fix two points, how many curves can pass through those two points exactly as the problem was for the circle before. Yeah, so isn't that related to that? Let's look at a picture, right? So imagine I have n circles, and I have a particularly bad pair of points. Okay, well, these are. Probably draw the circles. Let's try to draw them more like circles. So I have this circle, that circle, this. Okay, you get the idea. <laughs> okay, <laughs> doing a terrible job here. But um, so, if this was my entire configuration, then where are the lenses occurring? Well, if I just drew a single thing like that, I've eliminated all of my lenses. And how many cuts did I make? Well, I cut each of my circles once, so I only made n cuts. I see. So that's not a counterexample to this, because I'm allowed to make n to the 3 halves cuts. Now you might be scared that my picture locally looks like this here, and over here it kind of somehow looks similar, and yet the circles are being reduced a lot in some crazy way. So if I were to just take every pair of points and make some cut, then that wouldn't be so good. I could be even less efficient about it. I can take my collection of curves, and every time two of them process, I just cut it there. And then there's no lenses, because there's no crossings at all. Sure. But if I have n algebraic curves of degree d, there's roughly n squared, uh, we don't care about d, there's roughly n squared places where they cross, so I have to do roughly n squared cuttings, and that's terribly inefficient. If I were to plug in, if I did them with n squared, we could track that through the proof and it's going to be a disaster. So this n to the three halves is getting a significant gain over the trivial bound. Is this optimal? Um, up, good question. 
Well, okay, so the epsilon we definitely don't need. Um, I don't know. n to the three halves is optimal for a slightly more general problem. So I think I can say to do better than n to the three halves, you have to do something quite different. Because there's something which looks like a counter example to a very similar problem, or not a counter example. There's an example to a very similar problem which gets n to the three halves, namely the joints problem. But yeah. you, you don't, you're not sure as of now for this concrete. For this concrete, no, actually, it's a good question. It's possible for this concrete thing, it could be fewer than n to the three halves. But I haven't thought seriously about it. It's possible you could take this joints example, which is not about curves in the plane, and somehow. Actually, yeah, I really don't know. Okay. Uh, I think significant new ideas would be needed to improve this, and I'm not at all convinced that it's possible to support it. Yeah. So, is there an algorithmic. Uh way of finding the minimal number of cuts? I don't know if there's an algorithmic way to find a minimum number. There's certainly an algorithmic way to find this number. So our way really is quite algorithmic. And you can even talk about its time complexity if you were so inclined. The minimum number, well, I mean, OK. There is a minimum way to find the algorithmic number, but it's not going to be a polynomial time algorithm. Because though each curve, for any particular curve, there's an infinite number of places you can cut it. Most of those infinitely many places are all equivalent to each other. So for any given curve, there's only finitely many uh, important places that one might cut it. And so now we have something stupid like n to the n possible way of okay. so this is no. So you can do it, but I don't know how to do it efficiently. Okay. So there's sort of two questions now. One is how do you prove this theorem? And the second is if you've proved it, how does it give us this result here? Um, so let's do this. I think the second issue. Once you've proved this, how do you get this result is a bit less interesting. So let's do it first sort of quickly, and then we'll run out the remainder of our time going into some details on this. So here's the basic idea for, uh, so let's give these things names. Let's call this theorem 1, call this theorem 2. So I want theorem 2 implies theorem 1. So take your n curves. Like theorem two, and we have n to the three halves plus epsilon segments, and I could ask you how many instances are there, how many point curve instances, well, I'm going to write down the value we had last time. Number of instances is, a, is big O of the number of points, which is M, that's the same, plus really it was the number of curves, that was the second quantity, plus M to the two thirds times the crossing, this is my crossing graph of the one third. And this is just writing down that previous bound for Zemery Trotter in a slightly more abstract form. How many points are there? Well, there's M. How many curves are there? Well, we started with n curves, but we cut them into n to the 3 halves pieces. So now this is big O of m plus n to the 3 halves plus epsilon plus m to the 2 thirds. And if we weren't careful, we might say, well, if we have n to the 3 halves of these pieces, and every piece can cross at most d times, then this is roughly d squared times n to the 3 halves squared, just n cubed, which looks kind of scary. But no, because these curve segments, they only came from n algebraic curves. So the number of times two curves can cross is still roughly n squared. So this is still n to the 2 thirds times n to the 2 thirds. OK. So this is an incidence bound. And we could ask, is it a good incidence bound or not? And the question kind of depends on how big is n compared to m. So if n is quite small, then probably this term if n, is, if n is tiny, then this term dominates, but that's a stupid situation to be in. If n is rather small, then this term dominates, and that looks great because this is sort of bound of the best we could possibly hope for. But if n is big, for example, if n is equal to m, then n equals m, this is m, this is m to the four thirds, this is m to the three halves. That's awful. That's what you would get from trivial bounds. So this is not good. So the basic idea is okay, um, can we take our overall configuration of points and curves and cut it up into pieces so that inside of each one of these pieces, the ratio of m and n is better. Namely, n is small compared to m inside of each one of these pieces, and then add it all back together. So 
everyone in this room likes to think about polynomial partitioning, so that's the obvious thing to try to do. So we could just be naive about it and say, okay, here's my collection of points, my collection of curves, and let's polynomial partition it. Cut it into cells, which I'll draw as squares, even though they're probably not. And say, is this good? We can try to apply this bound inside of each one of these cells, uh, and it's not good. And the reason it's not good is that um, each point lives in only one of the cells. So if I have, for example, um, d squared cells, then I might expect m over d squared points per cell, as the points are evenly distributed over the cells. I would expect something like m over d curves per cell, which is the sort of numerology that comes out of polynomial partitioning. And this is not good because the ratio of points to curves inside of each cell is moving in the wrong direction for us. Now there are even more curves relative to the number of points. And when you try to apply this bound inside of each one of the cells and optimize it, you discover the best thing to do is to not do this partitioning at all, instead of <laughs> d equal to 1. So this is not a good idea. What you should do instead is jump to the dual space. Dual space. So now we're considering the parameter space of curves. So every curve is going to be a point in this parameter space. And every point now corresponds to the set of all possible curves which hit that point. That's going to be a hyper uh, surface, or at least an algebraic variety in this parameter space. And this is a setting where polynomial partitioning works well, because when I chop up my space using polynomial partitioning, now each cell, each point lives in only one cell. So then the ratio of points to varieties is getting bigger inside of each cell, uh, sorry, smaller inside of each cell, which back over here is saying that n is getting smaller relative to m, and that's what makes this whole thing work. So I won't give any details for that. Um, all I'll say is I want to define what it means to have an algebraic degrees of freedom in such a way that that argument works. And so essentially what this means is my curves are curves which are selective.